and we have a wonderful talk tonight. Um, Elia Friedman is going to be talking about building businesses, not apps. This is a talk that was uh, well received, and um, people walked out uh, very either happy or depressed in Denver. Was it Denver? Ogden, Utah. Ogden, Utah. Sorry, at Coco Slopes. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to do a little housekeeping, and then we'll have Elias start right in. Um, so first off, um, sort of basic agenda for the evening. Um, for how many of you is this your first mobile portal meeting? Please raise your hand. Okay, good number of people. Thank you. Uh, so Mobile Portland, uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We we're about mobile. I don't know if you got that from the title. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we meet on the fourth Monday of every month. Uh, it's based on an international organization called Mobile Mondays. Um, we're not affiliated with Mobile Mondays, but we sort of follow a similar model. Um, the website is mobileportland.com. There's also a Google group. Um, you can subscribe either to the Google group, which you will find out not only about the upcoming events, but also job postings and um, things of that nature. Um, and also, you can subscribe to an announcements only list on mobileportland.com, uh, where we can, uh, where you can, you'll only get two emails a month: one announcing the meeting and one reminding you about the meeting. Um, there's a Twitter handle, and I keep forgetting to take off the IRC channel that Matt. Um, <laughs> so Matt, uh, Matt Gifford, uh, who also helps organize the meetings. Um, established an, F, an IRC channel uh, and then spent six months as the only person in it um, <laughs> before finally deciding that that maybe maybe he would give up. Um, but if you ever want to, you can join that IRC channel and see if Matt's there. I'm not convinced that he's not still waiting for somebody to join him. <laughs> you, can, you can be the first. Um, so uh, before we move on to talking about job openings and announcements, I wanted to thank our sponsors. Uh, Campaign Monitor, who helps us do our emails for free. Um, Cloud4, my company, we uh, sponsor the food this month. And then um, Urban Airship, which helps us host the event. And Randall, did you want to talk about um, stuff at Urban Airship, or no? Um, or, did I get the name wrong, too? I'm oh, sorry. Ramsey. Ramsey, ah, sorry. Ramsey, right. do you want, no? Um, yes? Sure. Matt's got a mic. Hi. Urban Airship. Yeah, um, so this is uh, only my second time coming to this, and the first one was incredibly informative. Um, I wish I'd been coming to them sooner, because these are amazing events and really great to connect with people. Um, and as you said, we're, we're very happy to sponsor the space and, and help out any way we can. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and do the little plug, which is we have some open recs. If you have questions, want to know more about Urban Airship, I'll be around after the meeting to be able to answer anything you have. So. And Urban Airship has been a host of Mobile Portland almost from its beginning. Uh, so I want to give a round of applause for Urban Airship. Woo! Okay, so now is um, your time. If you have very, very short job openings or announcements, make it quick. Job announcements that are mobile related if you're searching for a job or hiring for someone. Good evening. Um, thank you to Urban Airship. I remember when we were in that smaller, smaller space and we all would have been crying in our knees. Um, my name is Scott, I'm with Tech Systems. Um, and so we are recruiting for over 150 companies in town. In order to keep it short, um, a couple of the companies we're recruiting for right now that have recs would be eBay and, and some of the digital sport groups at Nike, uh, the Gilban groups. Uh, but we also have clients that are, are doing mobile development in other areas as well. So um, if you're interested, um, please speak to me afterwards and enjoy the, enjoy the show. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Andy Saylor. I'm with a small little boutique consulting firm called Soft Source Consulting, and we are looking for mobile developer, mobile developers for a line of business applications and uh, other consumer type stuff. We really need very high level um, mobile developers that don't specialize in one particular thing. So we need kind of a jack of all trades, uh, someone that does front end development, HTML5 JavaScript, that knows iOS, uh, JavaScript, uh, JavaScript, Java. Android, um, the whole ball of wax, and so uh, we have clients like WebMD and Nike and Wizards of the Coast, uh, things like that. So that's what we're looking for. We need about three or four high-end mobile developers. Uh, we're really a fun company to work for. Come see me afterwards if uh, you're interested. Thank you. Rivermark Community Credit Union, um, not necessarily a standard mobile um, job opportunity, but we do have an opening for a .NET developer, and we are working in responsibly uh, design website. We just launched a responsibly designed website um, here back on Thursday, and they're looking to get the rest of our apps to go that route. All right. Um, so I, I have a favor to ask because we've got people in the back who do not have seats. Uh, so if you have an empty seat next to you, would you please raise your hand? Um, and if people are interested in finding seats, these are the places where you can come and find seats. We have tables this month. Um, we do not always have tables. You should come enjoy the tables. <laughs> I don't know that they will be here next month. These are limited quantity tables. Um, yeah, there is. A, you know, I don't know whether the tables are good or not. Actually, do people like tables? Like, it means less people can get in here. But people like the tables because like having. Okay. So what you don't know about the tables is that that means that this is like a classroom. You need to take notes, and there's a quiz after the presentation. Okay. See, people's opinions change very quickly. All right, uh, with no further ado, I want to introduce Elia Friedman. Uh, Elia has been in mobile longer than you all have been paying attention to mobile. Uh, I can say that with confidence because he was developing applications for Palm, um, then uh, did some BlackBerry stuff, I think. Um, Windows Mobile, all of these things. I'm, this is like I'm telling stories out of out of class about Elia. Like these are the things that he doesn't want people to know. Um, but he was, in fact, a BlackBerry and a Windows Phone developer. Uh, and then Infinity Softworks has been working on iOS applications. Um, and he's got a really interesting story to tell about how, the conclusions they've come to about trying to be successful in the App Store um, and sort of the differences between what it used to be like in being successful in mobile and what it's like now. So please join me in welcoming Ilya. Hey, hit the right button. Thank you all. I'm so an awesome turnout tonight. It's a pleasure to be able to give this presentation. Thank you all for coming out. Um, it's an honor and a privilege. I've been involved with Mobile Portland in various capacities over the last six years. We've been celebrating coming together monthly for these meetings, which is a pretty amazing accomplishment. It's been that many years. Mobile Portland is as old as the iPhone, and most of us think that the iPhone was introduced a good 30 or 40 years ago. And it just feels that way. It wasn't actually 30 or 40 years ago. So what's upon a time? Yeah, you're right, this thing is going to work for about 20 seconds. <laughs> Once upon a time, our interests as software developers matched up perfectly with the market leader. For most of computing history, Microsoft was that leader. They charged one time high prices for their products. We charged one time high prices for our products. Every one or two or Microsoft time, six years, they released an upgrade and charged an upgrade fee for it. We did exactly the same thing. It was a nice, 
relationship that we had for a very long period of time. But a dozen or so years ago, that really started to shift. <laughs> <laughs> the Windows upgrade cycle slowed, the internet became mainstream, suddenly it was possible to distribute software for free, to upgrade all of our customers automatically, something we never had the ability to do before. Moore's law didn't really change, but for all intents and purposes it did. For most of us, there was more than enough computing power on our systems by that point in time. We didn't really need any more. And because of that, because the hardware prices, because hardware wasn't accelerating, the prices dropped. And we had the opportunity. Yeah, but there's. <laughs> now you're right, I'm going to be stuck with that thing. <laughs> Is that any better? Yeah, that it'll, it'll cut out as well. <laughs> Our <laughs> microphones are problematic in this space, um, but it doesn't seem to cut out quite as bad. Okay, well, we'll work with this. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's not as much feedback either. It actually sounds a lot better. So, where was I? As hardware prices dropped, we also ended up in a situation where uh, we could get miniaturization in systems that we didn't have before. And this is really where Apple exploded. First we had the iPod, then we had the iPhone, then we had the iPad. Google didn't want to be left behind. We had Android. Microsoft did fall behind. Us software developers, though, we were really caught in the middle of some pretty massive tectonic shifts. These were unprecedented in the computing history. It had always been the same way, and suddenly we were scrambling to figure out new ways to run our businesses. Our business model shifted. We were no longer in line with the market leaders. You know, Apple makes their money on hardware. They give the software away for free. Google makes their money off of ads. They give the software away for free. My own company, Infinity Softworks, was really caught in the middle. I founded the company as a senior in college in 1997. I was a business major. I used a financial calculator all through school and was absolutely annoyed that I could see one stupid little number on the screen at, one, at the same time. So the first product that I wrote when I started writing for Palm Pilot was a financial calculator. And I invented a template, a combination of a spreadsheet and a calculator. You could do what-if scenario, but you could also see all your own data. We started there, but we quickly expanded into scientific calculation, into vertical markets like education and finance and real estate. Then we added the ability to write your own stuff. And because of that, our customers took it into thousands of markets. Pipe fitting calculations, vineyard management calculations, everything we could possibly think of. At our peak, we were one of the most successful companies in the palm economy. Our prices were as high as 160 bucks a copy, and we were growing 100% every year. But things changed. Palm faded, Microsoft faded, Windows Mobile faded. Apple and Google took over. The App Store exploded. A gold rush ensued. Just create an app. Stick it in the App Store. You'll be rich in no time, was what we all thought. It didn't matter that we were charging five bucks instead of 50 bucks. We'll make it up in volume, right? And that's where we are. That's where we've been, and that's where a lot of the mentality is. But this is all a fallacy. It doesn't work. So what I'm about to share with you today is actually a personal journey. This is a company that, that was on the brink of disappearing, really, in the middle of this transition. We were on the brink of trying to figure out how in the world to make this work in this new world of app stores. And I spent years, painstaking years, understanding this and working within the App Store and trying to figure out how to make this whole system work for us. And what came out the other side is that we just had the wrong product. We didn't have the wrong customers. We had 20 million distributed units in, in our history. So we had the customers. We had the right idea. Customers needed to be able to do quick calculations on the go. They needed to be able to do back of the envelope stuff. We just had the wrong product. And out of this analysis came a new product for us, a new service, a web and mobile product called Equals. And this, while well, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about Equals tonight, 
This is the journey that we took, the analysis that we did to understand what was happening there and how we were going to make our transition. So the first thing I want to talk about, though, is that the App Store really is a pretty amazing place. For the first time in our history, all the installation, reinstallation, and app maintenance issues really go away. At our peak, we had multiple people handling customer support full time. And 80% of the stuff, 80% of the issues that they dealt with were exactly these ones that I just mentioned. <coughs> it was a real pain in the neck, to be honest with you. So the App Store got rid of almost all that support. I do it now in my part in part time. It also caused a massive explosion in app downloads. For iOS alone, we're over 60 billion. And if you add an Android, we're well over 100 billion. But what didn't really fundamentally change, at least not in the last 10 years, it was a lot more expensive before that, but what really didn't fundamentally change is the cost to actually develop applications. Craig Hockenberry, a pretty well-respected developer at Icon Factory, estimates that for them to do a server and app system, you're looking at half a million dollars. Even a cheap application, we're looking at 8,000. That's only a couple weeks worth of work, really. The problem comes in, though, is that we're not making that kind of money off of the apps. If you look at the total number of apps and the total number of amount of money that Apple has paid out in the App Store, you're looking at about 4,000 bucks an app. But even that's not true. So this is a guy I know named Justin Williams. They released an app shortly in December. He's a well-known developer. In fact, I met him at that Cocoa Slopes where I gave this presentation the first time. He released a new app called Photos Plus, and this was his sales curve over the first week. Huge spike. Each one of those dots, if you can see them, they look like they're a little faded out there, but each one of those dots represent a day. Huge spike the first day, a smaller spike the next day, and pretty much nothing after that. This is pretty typical from what I've seen. What we do know is that most of the money in the app stores actually go to the top 100 apps, about 85%. So, if you are the maker of Candy Crush, you've done pretty well for yourself. <laughs> but if you're me, and pretty much everybody else, then there's less money involved. So if there's a million apps, and we're talking about 860,000 apps that are actually splitting 15% of the revenue. And when you do the math on that, we're really talking about 2,600 bucks an app. There just isn't any gold in them that are built. <laughs> And that's why this was the first conclusion that we came to. This was the first bit of understanding that we made. We tried everything in the App Store, short of apps. It was the one thing we never got around to, because we kind of lost the faith by that. And we're not talking about an app that didn't have its breaks. We were involved with the iPad launch, we were featured, we were a top 10 finance category app for a long time. We have iOS and Android. We were one of Apple's top apps of 2010. So we've had plenty of breaks, a lot more than most people get, a lot more than most of us will get these days, including us. But this is what led us to this conclusion. We can't keep thinking about building apps and actually being able to make money. We gotta start shifting. We gotta start thinking about what it is to build business and how we make that whole thing work. So we went back to the basics and I went back to my marketing 101 class and I said, okay, well, what is this? What is marketing really? And for those of you that haven't had that class, it's four Ps, product, place, Price and promotion. <coughs> now what's happened in the App Store? How have we ended up where we are today? <coughs> Fundamentally, it's happened because there's only one place. And when you have no choice on place, it starts to play funny games with the rest of the, with the, rest of the matrix. When you have one place to fly, everyone looks there. If everyone looks there, there's only one place to promote. Well, what's promotion in the App Store? Five screenshots, an icon, an app name, a description that nobody reads. Maybe a video if you're on Google. That one's nice, but you better make it look professional, which is hard in and of itself. And when we get through the promotion piece, once we realize that it's really hard to promote, then we start getting into a situation where it's hard to differentiate. And once we realize that it's hard to differentiate, then all of our prices drop. And that's how we've ended up with the 99 cent push and everything else associated. So
So the conclusion that we came to very early on was that the App Store really needs a new slogan. It's an amazingly great place to distribute your stuff. It's a really lousy place to make any money. <laughs> so we went back to the drawing board. And we rethought everything. Really, at the end of the day, what this presentation is all about is all the pieces that we thought about and all the things that we looked at as we move from making, from making apps to making businesses. So the rest of this presentation is literally me stepping through a lot of the thinking that we did. And they're nicely bulleted so we can all follow along. The first thing we started with was free. The app store is moving in this direction. What was that? It was a horrible quote, by the way. And it's always quoted out of context. But what's the old quote about content wants to be free? Except that wasn't what he actually said. What he actually said was some content wants to be free and some content wants to be really expensive, but nobody seemed to remember the second half of that. <laughs> that must have been an American short memory problem. But whatever the case is, clearly the it wants to be free is the way that this thing is all moving. We already talked about the million apps. I spent some time in preparation looking at the App Store and trying to look at all the categories where we could find apps and the major places where developers like us would develop an app and push it into the App Store. And I picked out four, just for argument's sake. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if you follow the news, there seems to be another to-do app every day. Notes apps, calculator apps, and then I picked one for argument's sake, just because it was a category I understood, which was spreadsheets. 2,200, by the way, is the maximum number of searches you can get out of the App Store. There's far more than this. At one point, before they lifted the limit, I had calculated 6,500 calculators, and that's going back a couple of years. So we're talking a ton of applications in these major categories. Even 230 spreadsheets. You know how hard it is to write a spreadsheet? These things are complicated. So I said, okay, you know, these are really broad categories. Let's look at some real niche stuff. Well, I understand calculators. I understand all the niche categories. So I literally looked at a series of niche categories that half one percent, half of a half of one percent might actually use in the calculator space, and I still came up with a ridiculous number of results. Twelve results for complex number calculators. Come on. <laughs> and keep in mind, complex number. These are the people who thought it would be wise to actually use this as a keyword. This doesn't even describe all the apps that actually have complex number of functionality in them, including ours, which doesn't use that as a keyword. The matrix one's the one that cracked me up. I figured there's one matrix calculator for every person in the world who actually does matrix math. <laughs> so I said, okay, obviously this is a bad example. Every developer I've ever met thinks their calculator sucks and they can do a better job. So let's try something else. And I thought about my dad. My dad's a piano technician. He's had software for tuning pianos for, geez, 15 years. It's 20 years. First it was on a Mac, then it was on Windows Mobile, and now he's on an iPhone. And he's got some great software for doing this. But I'll tell you, there can't be more than a couple thousand piano technicians, maybe 4,000 piano technicians in the entire country. So how many apps could we talk, possibly talking about that could support 4,000 Piano tuners. Well, I found 23. Each one of these get one customer, right? I mean, it's insane. So what's happened? Well, when you got that many apps, who cares if they disappear? And they're cheap. So we've got six cents per app for Android, 19 cents per app for iPhone, 50 cents per app for iPad. <coughs> We're practically free, folks. You might as well just get there. In fact, we are mostly free. Florida reported this data early last year. 90% of apps were free. Personally, I don't know if you can see it, how well this can actually be seen. But you can see over here under 2010, there used to be this really dark green line right at the top that no longer exists. Those are all the apps <laughs> over six bucks. Uh, we are at the $5 range, so there might be 1% of all the apps in the App Store are actually at that tier. So those apps have pretty much disappeared. I read a Gartner report recently that they predict, not that I would ever believe anything that Gartner ever quoted, but for the sake of argument, we'll go with it here. 98% of all apps will be free in the next few years. This is worse, by the way. This is only iOS. This is actually worse on the Android side. 
Another piece of information, if you're not already convinced, Jeremy Olson runs a development house called Tappity, really well-respected developer, and he queried a bunch of people that he knew. Basically, they're selling 25% less than they were a year ago, even in the same positions in their categories. We've had some, or I'm sorry, they're selling 25% of what they had a year ago, not 25% less. We haven't been quite that steep a drop off, but we've definitely seen one too. I don't know, 4,000 bucks, 4,000 units times 70% times because Apple keeps 30, times 70 cents means not much money. <laughs> and then of course, from my perspective, Apple really nailed the paid app category shut when they released the iWork suite for free. We already had Google Docs for free. I think you have Office 365 for free. Now you have iWorks for free. It's three of the most complicated applications ever developed for mobile platforms. They're all free. And I looked at this and I felt like a little kid. The whole world went back against me. <laughs> so we needed a different approach. So the first thing we started thinking about was recurring revenue. And what I know from all these years of experience is that finding new customers is very, very complicated. It's very expensive, and it's very hard. And the way the App Store works when you get a one-time fee, of course, is that you get one-time fee from those customers. You don't get to charge. So we were stuck with that. You always had to find new customers, but they're the most expensive. What we really want to do is sell more product, product to those who already love us and want to buy stuff from us. Now, once upon a time, we did that with trials and upgrades. But those avenues obviously aren't open to us anymore, at least not mobile, and barely they're on, on the desktop. Joel Spolsky said this, it's one of my favorite quotes. I have a few quotes in here that are going to be labeled as one of my favorite quotes, but the only business models I want to work on anymore have some mass market component that's absolutely free and a niche companion product that makes money off the exhaust fumes of the mass market component. If you're not familiar with Joel's work, he's the man behind Stack Overflow man behind Trello, maybe one of the most influential developers of our time in some ways. I know that I've gotten more out of Stack Overflow than any money I've possibly put into the web. So getting existing, dedicated, happy customers to pay us a few bucks more is a lot better able to support us as a company. And a lot of companies have started using in-app purchases. I believe this is why Apple integrated in-app purchases. 76% of paid revenue is now coming from in-app purchases. And this guy David Bernard on Twitter one day listed some really good reasons to go to in-app purchases if you fall into one of these. You have a ridiculously large number of downloads and in-app purchase might work for you. This is the fumes of the mass market product. Do you have a really high conversion rate? For the life of me, I can't remember the app, but I heard about an app that was getting 40 and 50% conversion rate. Absolutely insane. I figured they were selling cocaine. <laughs> How about really high prices? I mean, if you can charge 50, 100 bucks, even 20 or 25 bucks for your in-app purchase, you're probably doing pretty well with this kind of model, even with a small number of people. And of course, recurring revenue. Now, the guys that mastered this bad boy, man, those are the gaming companies. They figured it out. You might not like the games that they're playing psychologically, but you've got to be really impressed with how they figured it out. Getting people to buy swords and to speed up gameplay by spending money on it? Jeez, I wish I would have come up with that one. So when I took this screenshot a few months ago, every one of the top grossing apps in the iOS app store were all free. Every single one of them. And every single one of them were a game or an entertainment app. Now, I'm into productivity apps, and I'm not really into games. So I like subscriptions. This was put together by a guy named Ben Thompson in a really good article. And by the way, there's a link way down here at the bottom on every one of these slides to tell you where my source is if you're curious. So if you look at this nice jagged line, that's the value that the customers are actually getting from the products. <clears throat> Traditionally, when you charge one price, you get this flat line that goes right across here. So the value that the customer is getting and the value that we're getting are really disconnected. But if we can figure out a product that you can charge a subscription for, then it changes the argument. That's this line. 
suddenly our value, our price value, and our customer value start to fall into line with each other. And I think that makes a big difference. A lot of companies have figured this out. Asana develops a really, really awesome task management application. They charge, they give it away for free to most people, but if you got a team, you get to a certain size, they charge you for that. Evernote's got the perfect traditional freemium model. They give you a whole bunch for free and get a small group of people to pay. I believe they're five or six percent of their customer base are paying them now. Ruambi is a business intelligence service that's giving the app away for free, but charging for servers and seats at the enterprise level. 37 Signals has a more traditional trial and subscription model, and of course Major League Baseball has done an amazing job with premium content. But there's another model for recurring payments, and that's apps. As developers, we tend to discount this model a quick bit. I know when I was in Ogden and gave this presentation, I got a ton of frowns when I put this slide up there. But look, even Apple does it. We all do ads. The thing that I think is important about ads is not only is it a recurring revenue stream, but there's all kinds of different ways to do it. When we're building an app, we take whatever banner ad we've got and we slap it into the app. But when we're building a business, we try to think through a model that works for the business. And I picked out just a few. AdWords was a perfect example of this long before mobile, right? I mean, for most of us, we didn't even know there was a promoted portion in relation to a, a natural organic portion. <coughs> it fit in so perfectly, and that's basically what allows Google to do all the crazy stuff that they do today. PBS figured this out a long time ago, too. Those sponsorships make you feel good when you hear them. They don't, they don't annoy you when you want, you want to get them out of the way. And they figured out how to put them in such a way that they didn't take up the entire show and interrupt every five or ten seconds. Facebook did a lot with banner ads in the early days. They're doing more of the in-stream promotion now. But from my perspective, Twitter's the one that figured that one out. I actually read some of those promoted tweets. They actually make sense and things I want to learn about. So these are all the things that we started thinking about. How are we going to get additional revenue out of our customers? How are we going to make them happy enough to want to pay us a recurring fee? Or, be happy? or how can we figure out advertising in such a way that it fits naturally into the product that we're developing? Yeah, okay, this is the recurring part. And I know I made a whole bunch of comments about acquiring customers and how hard it is. And it is. But the reality is we have to do it. Otherwise, we've got nobody to look at our advertising. From my perspective, free is a big part of that. Put a free app out there, it makes it a lot easier for people to download and start to look at it. But it doesn't make it any easier for us to get those people. They're still hard to find. So I looked at some analysis. This is from a guy named Jason Cohen at a smart bear. And he is actually a pretty smart bear. And uh, he had a few terms that I thought were worth going over, some things that some of us might not have heard about. And the first is, uh, so this was all built around an idea of how to figure out how much money you can spend on an ad in order to get people to your website or to your application each month. So we start with recurring revenue and how much are we making every month. And then we move on to the lifetime value of that customer. And in his estimate, you multiply that number by 20. I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of math here. I just threw it up there for your own references. But you multiply that number by 20. Now obviously if you're charging a one-time fee, you get to multiply it by one. But in his case, he's making the assumption that your customer is going to stick around for about 20 months. That may be different once you actually get data. And then we talk about the cost to actually acquire that customer. So we take that lifetime value and divide it by five. If you're funded, probably by four. But only a certain number of those people actually pay. And then, of course, it costs us something to put those ads in front of people. So I ran a few scenarios. Five bucks in the app store, 350 net. You get to spend seven tenths of one cent on advertising. I haven't found too many opportunities where spending seven tenths of one cent on advertising actually gets you any advertising. So it isn't until we actually get into recurring revenue that it starts to make any sense. Twenty bucks per year, we get to spend seven cents. Five bucks per month, twenty. Fifty bucks per month, two bucks. Now we're talking some real dollars. Now we're talking some promotion that we can actually do. So I did a little research. Finance calculator AdWords in the app in uh, Google, 250. 
I don't know about you, I haven't found too many financial calculators that can derive 50 bucks per month. Otherwise, I would have done that by now. But all the same, it was worth analyzing. Let's go a little more low key. How about a website, an RSS feed like Darren Carter, <coughs> very, very popular Apple blog? Four cents, not worth the 20 bucks per year level. It's reasonable. 20 bucks per year, less than two bucks a month, less than four coffees. How about a podcast? Three cents. So we're now in the ballpark. And now once we move into recurring revenues, we can start to see a path, a path to actually being able to promote, a path to actually being able to figure out how to bring your customers in, and not just relying on word of mouth to make that happen. The fourth thing we looked at very closely was cross-platform. Now I'll tell you, when we were building an app, when we were building Power One, we didn't think about cross-platform. We developed the app and we put it in the App Store. We used as much Objective-C as we could possibly use and used whatever legacy code we had lying around to make it happen. It just so happened that a big chunk of it was from the Palm days and we could use a huge C engine to make that work. But the reality is we didn't think too hard about the technology. We used what Apple gave us. So this gets back to the place problem. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. This, so when we started working on the new solution, that really changed things. And we started thinking about cross-platform a lot more. We started thinking about all kinds of things that we didn't think of before. And that's where the place thing came in for us. So this started with Power One. And we said, well, look, if we have an Android app, then that partly gets us out of the place problem, because we can put it, put it in Google Play. But when we started thinking about it from a business perspective, we started thinking about a heck of a lot more than just that. We started thinking about all the places where we could probably put an app if we had apps for them. This is the only way to break that problem down. You develop only an iOS app, you're only in the iOS app store. You develop a website, and you can sell it yourself. An Android app, and you can go into the Google Play Store. Samsung App Store. Optimize for Kindle, and you're there as well. So it gives us a lot of possibilities. It also lets us talk to an awful lot more customers. Obviously, a lot of people on the web. But even when we look at it, 75 million Mac, Mac customers is nothing to sneeze at. That's actually a lot of people. And to make it even better, those Mac people actually spend money. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that we had to think about when it came to cross-platform. We had to think about what systems our customers were actually using. As I started to talk about before, we had to think about the technologies that we were using to make it more cost-effective to move cross-platform. All of a sudden, we're dealing with a dizzying array of screens. Everything from those four-inch iPhones all the way up to my 30-inch monitor. We had decisions about what stores we wanted to support, and because of that, we had decisions to make about what features we wanted to support on various platforms. samsung has got all kinds of crazy stuff on their devices. And then we also had to start thinking about server expenses, because now we're cross-platform, and all of a sudden our customers expect things to, I don't know, be on the platform where they are. These are all decisions we never had to think about before when we were building apps. But when we started thinking about building a business, when we started thinking about equals the service, suddenly we had all these different decisions, all these different choices we needed to make. And it was important for us to think through these things in advance. I'll tell you, the other thing we never gave much thought to before was global. <coughs> We wrote back in the Palm days. It was English, and there was everybody else. Okay, later in the world there was e-figs. English, French, Italian, German, Spanish. Don't know what happened to the Portuguese. They kind of got left out. Later there was Japanese. But this has really changed a lot. So we're no longer, English is no longer dominant. English is now a fraction of the downloads across the globe. Only 28%. So the opportunities moved overseas. Power One is an application that's built with an amazing amount of text in it. There's instructions everywhere. So when we started thinking about redoing this, we really had to think about an awful lot of stuff. How did we get out of the business of providing text? Do we iconify our applications? How do we localize dates and numbers? How do we do that on mobile devices and how do we do that on the web? 
Do we do right to left text layouts as well as we do left to right? And what do we do with all those crazy Far East characters that we don't know how to read? Now we did try something with localization early on, and it does seem to have some effect. And that was at least localizing the app store description. Because if I'm German and I'm looking for a time value of money calculator, I'm sure not looking for time value of money, I'm looking for whatever that translation is in German. And that was important too. There was one other thing that uh, I took the developers by surprise with in Ogden that they didn't think that much about. And it actually turned out to be a, a, a very minimal amount of time for us and a huge benefit to us. I don't know how Google does this, but Apple makes it really, really easy, and that's integrating voiceover support, making it easy for people with sight impairments to be able to use an application. And we got a lot of uh, word of mouth out of this among the sight impaired community. When they found the app, one of the few calculators that have ever integrated it, all of a sudden, all of them started talking to each other. This is a great post by Matt Gemmel. It's a few years old already, but it's a great post if, uh, if you're feeling any way, shape, or form in one direction or another about this topic, and I have a great time taking a look at it. At the end of the day, we're really developers, and it's really hard to get away from thinking about product. A lot of this presentation so far, a lot of the thinking that we went through was really thinking through all of these issues that were not really product-related. They were, they were location relations and place relations and promotion issues and all those kind of things. But then when we got back to thinking about the product itself and even the things that we wanted to think about there, there were a few things that came up for me that I haven't heard a lot of talk about. One of those is how do we build simple applications, things that people are more likely to pick up and use. I don't know about you guys, but I'm never going to fill out all these fields. There's too many of them. I have no interest in that. Okay, I lied. I made over 10 of I filled out all the fields in iTunes, but I'm sure not going to do it in high res because that's just too much time. I came up with an idea called the single box theory of design. That the closer we can get to having a single box for the, for the user to integrate with, the more likely they are to actually pick up and use the product. Google, obviously, is the master of this. You can find anything just by typing into a single box. I've been doing image searches for this entire presentation. Instead of having a separate site or a big pop-up list for images, I just say images at the end and they give me all that information right in line. Twitter too makes it really easy, a single box. I think this is one of the reasons why Twitter really took off. Even in complex applications like the calendar, where we think about lots of boxes to fill in, who I'm meeting, where the location is, the time, the end time, the repeating, all that crazy information that we fill in, even Apple figured out how to reduce that to a single box. One little box, you enter the whole thing in, it figures out how to parse it all and puts it on your calendar. The next thing we thought about was depth. And we've been thinking about this one for a long time. This is power wine. For the average user, it's really easy to use. You tap into a field, you enter in your number, you save it. When you want to calculate, you hit the equals button. The one on, the, on, the, on my right, your left, the area conversion one automatically calculates. But we didn't stop there. We thought about our power users and what they would want to do. And what we did was create a language on the back end that made it really easy for them to create calculations. Even this wasn't easy at all. That went into our thinking for equals. Probably the biggest lesson I've learned in the iOS world is that we can't just think about functionality anymore. This was a very early iOS application. I'm sorry. This was a very early iPhone application. It wasn't even iOS in those days. These guys were around in the fall days. Very nice group of guys, but their apps were really, really ugly. They just got ripped up one side and down the other by the community. It's not just good enough anymore to be thinking about function. We have to be thinking about form as well, how a user interacts and what they expect to do with it. Please think offline. We, yeah, most of these devices have connections most of the time. But that 20%, 30% when you don't? I mean, this whole app is useless when I don't have a connection. And it's not just here in the U, it's here in the United States, right? I walk into my daughter's elementary school and I have no internet connection. I couldn't even do math with them if I could. 
So we have to think about dual mode use cases. This is really where Google excels. Google's really good at this. You get your calendar, your contacts, all that stuff offline and instantaneously syncs to the web. You don't even know what's happening. But we need to think connected as well. I'm not just in one place anymore. I'm not just at my desk. I have an iPhone, I have an iPad. I expect everything to stay in sync. And it's not just me. I have people I need to, con to connect with as well. The last thing that I want to talk about here is technology. And I steered clear of technology for most of this because I think as technologists, as product people, we tend to think about this stuff. But I think when we're building products, we need to, we really need, as we're building businesses, I mean, we really need to be thinking about the whole stack of the product. I love this quote from Tim Cook. We believe that we need to own and control the primary technologies behind the products that we make. For Apple, that's software and hardware. For Google, that's servers and software. We're so busy getting products done that we make these decisions that impact our businesses and we don't think about it because we're running so fast to make that happen. Look, the reality is there's some things that we just can't outsource, even as much as we'd like to. Other things are fair game, though. Another great quote, this one from Brent Simmons. You don't want to limit your success because you didn't want to write your own server software. I think back to Steve Jobs standing on stage introducing the iPhone. I mean, look at that device. This, is, this stupid little device here completely changed all of mobile. In one hour of standing on stage, Steve Jobs changed the entire trajectory of the market. Changed the entire way that we develop and sell and distribute software in one instance. And look at that device. They did the hardware, they did the software, they even did all the apps. Nobody else can put apps on that thing. If you're developing a business and you expect to be successful, then you better make sure you're in control of that success. There's a limit, of course. If I'm working on equals, I'm not about to create my own data center. It doesn't make sense for me. And even for a company of Apple's size, it didn't make sense to own the wireless network. They outsourced that. The point of this whole thing, though, and the, the point of what we've gone through as a company is that we really needed to think through these issues. We need to think about what we wanted to accomplish. We need to think about what, our, what the goals we wanted to achieve. Look, if an app is what your goal is, if an app makes it happen for you, then more power to you. Go develop an app. But I think more and more, in order to achieve the goals that we want to achieve, I think we're going to have to build businesses. Because that's where the future is. Thank you. Well, if you have any questions, uh, just put up your hand. I'll come around with the mic. I was wondering if these slides are available somewhere since uh, the left and right 10% was cut off for pretty much the whole show. Oh, were they right? Yeah. 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 They're pretty close. Uh, now, all of the URLs, the bit.ly stuff. You saw the bit.ly. Oh, right. Right. Okay, they were a little off on the side. Really, yeah. really, if you provide a PDF, we'll post it with the top of the board. Yeah, I, That'd be great. I do on my blog, actually, I'll, and I'll, I'll uh, I'll make sure it gets posted again at the point where the video gets posted. Mark. So the slides are already up on your blog? They are from October, but okay. I'll, I'll make sure they get linked. So if you, you want to get them sooner, heliainsider.com um, and then look for Coco Slopes. Yeah, that's probably a good thing to look for. I think for us, so we haven't released equals yet. 
we're still working on the launch plan and how we're bringing that to market and all those things. So we haven't actually converted our customers yet to that model. But I would argue that probably the biggest hump for me was mental. You know, I was steeped pretty severely in this world of selling product and charging upgrades. And it was really, really mentally hard to move myself out of that world. And I've talked about it for a long time. So, if you ever got involved in custom contract development, I think when you get enmeshed in that world, it gets really, really hard to think about developing and shipping your own products. And in a lot of ways, this was the same way. We were so steeped in that mentality and that culture. Honestly, the, uh, the, the transformation happened many, many years before uh, iOS came out. We were working on a web, on a, a web application for education. And uh, Bill Kelly is actually here somewhere in the back of the room. It's taken me to school on what it actually means to build a web application. And I left a bunch of these meetings going, oh, I got completely the wrong product. But it took me years to really internalize that and to change my mentality in the way I was looking at, looking at products. Customers are a problem, too, because they want to drag you back into the old world you were used to. That was a big part of it. But yeah, I would say the mentality was probably the hardest part of the transformation. You talked high level about a lot of the business aspects. Uh, can you some more details of what you went through and where your application is now and where you see you going in the next couple of years? Sure. Um, so when we released Power One, originally it was a single application uh, for iOS only. Then, uh, let's see, the iPad came out and really gave us a big boost. And we started seeing an opportunity to move into other categories. So we released a few, oh, first we released a free version, um, figuring we could try a free version and a paid version. Then we tried uh, multiple products in different categories, and we spent a lot of time trying to optimize the search stuff in the App Store, which is a real uh, a black bag, a real black box trying to figure that out. Um, then we integrated in-app purchases into our light versions, but we didn't have high enough prices and we didn't have quite enough volume to really make that pay off. Uh, let's see, I'm still going. Um, we never tried ads. About the only thing that we never tried in this entire history was integrating ads into our application. But it was at that point that we started really working on equals and really starting to think about that. When we first started to develop equals, when I first showed it to Jason two years ago, it was a standalone $5 application that we developed. It was all text-based. There was nothing else to it. We had this nice kind of schemorphic interface on iOS. So glad we didn't ship that one now. <laughs> um, would have been redesigning it by now. Um, we had this beautiful, nice little schemorphic interface. And uh, it was all built around this idea that a note that can translate. So equals basically takes a typed note and can tell the difference between equations, variables, and text. And you can write the whole thing in English or French or German or Spanish or whatever language you happen to speak, including the equations and the variables. And it really just understands what those are and figures out how to differentiate. And uh, so when we started this whole thing, we just wrote an app. And it turned out that was a great little prototype. We got to show it off to a bunch of people. We got farther and farther into this and we said, wait a second, that's not going to achieve anything for us. It's just another $5 app. We said, okay, well, what does this mean if we... So the first thing we said was, well, what if we change? What if we go to, what if this was a recurring revenue product instead? What would that be like? And what would the feature set have to be like to make that work? What would even satisfy us internally? And so that's kind of this feedback loop that started to happen. Obviously, over the last couple of years, we spent a very small amount of time on equals and a very large amount of time on Power One. And, and we've been doing contract work, and we've got white label contracts. And oh, we did white label too. That was another thing that we did. Um, so we did all these different things and we've been maintaining those relationships and working kind of part-time on equals, continuing to advance it and advance the technology and the product and continuing to show it to people all along until we were kind of ready to start flipping the switch. But we tried pretty much everything I talked about on, in this presentation over the last few years with varying levels of success. <clears throat> mentioned you know monthly recurring revenue and CAC, you know, cost of acquisition. How do you deal with, you know, or where does customers who don't necessarily like the changes that you make in the app for better or for worse? I mean those those were monthly recurring revenue and now they're gone. So it's like it solves the app, they just go um, so how do you look at the design of the app and how do you make changes 
try and keep everybody happy even though you can't. That's well, the quickest way to make nobody happy is to make everybody happy. Uh, <laughs> so we just went through this. <laughs> we released uh, Power One version 4 about three weeks ago, and uh, we moved from a new, more skeuomorphic design to this flatter design that is really the way to go on iOS 7, and we made some changes that let's just say really annoyed some of our customers. They were very vocal about it. I had a few that were telling me that whoever made this decision should be fired, which I thought was pretty funny since they were telling me. <laughs> so we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and make a decision about how we were going to work around this problem. And luckily, one of the things that we did in the new version is that we, the old app was very, very graphically intensive. We had a lot of images in the product. And with the new app and the new things that Apple's integrated, so we had kind of had this idea that we would develop themes for the application. And we, so the first thing we did is respond to every one of them and say we're sorry that you don't like it. And we're trying to figure out what to do. And the second thing that we did was we put together a plan. I went back to my designer and we put together three themes for each one of the applications. And then I wrote a blog post about it, posted it, and then emailed back every one of those customers that responded negatively to get their feedback. Everyone wrote me back and said they liked one of the new two, one of the two new designs. So I felt like we were safe, and then we implemented it. So that's going to go live here in the next couple of weeks. But at least it takes the sting out of the chain. But they still aren't in love, right? It's completely different, and customers don't like anything that has changed in some ways, right? Some customers love the change, and we heard a ton of that too, by the way. But some customers will never like a change, any change at all. We deal with that the best we can, and we move forward. And if it means losing some customers because it's a decision that we need to make for our best interest, then I guess we're going to lose those customers. You mentioned uh, the need for controlling the technologies, owning and controlling the technologies that are primary for your product, and also uh, cross-platform focusing on cross-platform, and, and I was wondering, and also uh, servers, maybe building out a server that's maybe related to that, and I was wondering, right, uh, is, I, I was wondering how you would, if you had any thoughts on getting customers invested in that, in, in the product and in the relationship of your, you know, you as a service provider with them, more so than in the app itself, is, is that a challenge? if you're trying to pull it. So well, we don't really talk about technology with the customers, right? We talk about, we talk about the goals that they have in using the product. So we had an interesting experience. I, um, we went out to a handful of our Power One customers to, uh, we put a website together for Equals, we put a video together, and we invited those customers. By the way, the website's equalsapp.com. If you're interested, there's a way to sign up to learn more if you do in the future. Um, we went out and we got our power, a handful of our power users to come back and talk with us. And we treated our power users are the ones who write templates, who write these calculations. And we invited them to come look at the website and we got a really good response. 30% of those people said they were interested in the new product, which we're real happy about. And then a couple of months, because we weren't done yet, a couple of months went by and I decided it would make a whole bunch of sense to do a survey and get a little better understanding of how they're using the product. So I went back to them. And I asked them eight, nine, ten questions. It was a five minute survey, but I think the one that I was most interested in personally in this entire survey was the question, if you could change Power One, what would you do differently? And I got back a bunch of answers that we'd already been thinking about in equals. So I knew I was on the right track. Honestly, it's an awful lot of time. I've spent 17 years thinking about this product space at the back of the envelope calculations. But even if I didn't, we've spent a ton of time just thinking about what this is all about, where the product can go, and what the category's like, and what we might want to do with this product, and what, our, what we know about our customers, and what they might want to do with this product. We went about showing people what we actually could do with the product to launch, and making sure that it matched up and could serve as a minimum viable product. Those were all things that we were doing throughout this product. So while we weren't talking to them about specific technology, 
we're getting a real clear understanding of the technologies that we needed to own. So the customers came back and said, well, I want my stuff to sync everywhere. I want to be able to use it on, on, we already knew they were using it on iOS and Android. They came back and said, well, I'd create a lot more templates if I could do it on a desktop. So we knew we needed to be thinking about a web version. I need an easier way of taking my template and sharing it with the rest of my <coughs> team. That's a pain today. So we knew we needed to make sure that we were in control of syncing. So we could immediately throw out things like iCloud. Now, we couldn't use iCloud. First of all, it's unreliable, so I wouldn't use it to begin with. But even if it was reliable, it only works for Apple products. It doesn't allow me to share. It doesn't allow me to have any control. So I knew that that wasn't the right solution. The right solution was obviously going to be us writing our own syncing back end. And that's costly, but it's cost effective in the long run. So those are some of the things that we're leading DAS down. So we moved more from the product, uh, feature product perspective to figure out the technologies that we really felt that we needed. Really great, really great presentation, Elliot. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I wonder how you see two kind of large forces uh, that are headed in each other's direction uh, affecting the future evolution of, of the sort of service model business that you're talking about. One is uh, TechCrunch just reported today that the 10 billion that Apple paid out last year, 92 percent was in-app uh, purchases in free apps. Uh, so it's definitely just you know confirms the sort of direction that you're talking about. Yeah, these numbers are already off. Wow, that's yeah, like six months. But, but the other is uh, Mark Andreessen, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, venture capital firm, just wrote in the New York Times on Sunday a big opinion piece about they're betting very big on Bitcoin because they see Bitcoin as reducing basically the the micropayments problem versus advertising as a revenue source. Um, that we've had the past you know, 15, 20 years of the internet, et cetera. Uh, and reducing it in a way that you basically will be able to pay in a reasonable fashion per use for any service product that you have, which cuts down a lot of barriers and makes it much more international at the same time. Those two things really seem to be kind of coming at each other from different angles, but they probably have a big impact on uh, the future evolution of the service business model. What do you think about all that? Well, first of all, anyone who didn't read that Mark Anderson uh, article, uh, do a search for it and go read it. If you did not understand Bitcoin before, you will understand it now. It is an unbelievably well-written article. I will say I didn't fully understand Bitcoin before I read that. Um, I think micropayments are really, really fascinating. But I think they're going to be used in certain areas and not other areas. Does it allow us to bring the price down of our applications? Does it allow us to get to a few cents for an application usage? Yeah, but I think there's more practical uses for it. Um, one of the things that I, I feel personally is really interesting about Bitcoin is eliminating the percentage that we have to pay to the banks. Uh, if you're unaware, you pay 30 cents per transaction plus anywhere from 2% to 4%, 4.5%, depending on, on what that is. And then if the person denies the charge, you end up paying whatever that is, 25 or 30 bucks for the denial of that service. So you really can't get your, I mean, even in 99 cents, you've already given up like 50% of your revenue before you can even make that model uh, work for you, and that's way too much. So I think Bitcoin is really interesting in some ways. Uh, we always had, we've got users who contribute all these calculations. I even have a few customers who we worked out deals where we sell them for them. Our medical product is basically written by a pharmacologist in Indiana uh, that works at, I think, the University of Indiana, actually. And uh, boy, I would love to be able to build into this whole equals model the ability for people to sell what they've created. I mean, think about a product like a service like Etsy. I mean, they've got some lower limit on what they can charge today, but that's not necessarily what the market will bear. It'd be nice if people could actually price this thing at whatever they want to price it. So I don't see those things as mutually exclusive. In-app purchase is a purchase method where Bitcoin is a, is a tool for purchasing. Um, I'll be surprised when Apple takes Bitcoin, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Leo.
Uh, the next meeting is February 24th, 6 p.m. here as well, and we'll see you then. Thanks.